This is the Authentic Change Podcast, and I am Mike Horn. Authenticity reflects what we want from each other and our organizations. Open communication, trust, community, fun, and opportunity. I want to help you to do your best in your personal and professional relationships. This podcast delivers expertise, insights, and approaches on authentic leadership, to live your purpose, to lead from your values, to establish connected relationships, to steward people and culture change, to build and sustain prosperity, and to open doors and possibilities. This podcast will assist you in paving the way forward to personal, team, and organizational prosperity. Welcome to this episode of Authentic Change with Mike Horn. I am particularly delighted to welcome all of our listeners to season two of Authentic Change with Mike Horn. And I couldn't think or imagine a better personality, a better person um, to kick off season two with me than Dino Cataneo. Um, what intrigued me about Dino when we first connected and uh, began preparing for our work was his 2020 podcast that he launched in 2020, Authentic Leadership for Everyday People. So it was this uh, idea of connecting with every person on the topic of authentic leadership that uh, drew me to you, Dino. And uh, it's a delight for me to uh, open season two of Authentic Change with Mike Horn. I, that puts us somewhere in the um, uh, maybe the 25th or 26th or 27th episode. I'll, I'll have to take a look, but welcome. I'm glad you know, you're here. Yeah, and uh, it's great to be here, Mike. And I was just as attracted when somebody, you know, when I saw, oh, authentic change. Well, I got the leadership, he's got the change. And, and this is why um, this is sort of like either you may be listening right now to either the second part of our two parters or the first part if you're starting the conversation here, because Mike is on my podcast this week too. I think as so many of our listeners know, and, uh, you know, it's always great when I hear from colleagues about how they've benefited from a certain podcast, how they've enjoyed uh, hearing uh, voices uh, that are familiar to them on the podcast. And it's such a gift to um, be able to anchor a podcast in a specific event. To yeah. <laughs> let the audience know, oh, here's the beginning of uh, season two. And I'm delighted to do that because so often as I record uh, far in advance, uh, we're masquerading dates and hoping that events don't shape and transform the world in fundamental ways. But I, I suppose we would always pivot if that happened. Yes. You know, and if we, and if we, if everything goes as planned, our podcast will launch on the same day. So it's wonderful. One of the ways that you describe yourself, Dino, is the person of all trades. Uh, uh, and uh, you've, you're an entrepreneur. Yep. You're an executive coach and advisor. You work in marketing strategy and uh, digital transformation. You've got your own podcast. You're an amateur. Uh, you're a musician. When, yeah, I think anybody who plays, we can uh, take off the label amateur and maybe we just what we would call stars, right? Yeah. Um, tell, tell the audience about you, Dino. Yeah, so I, I jokingly say, I have two things that I say jokingly. One is that I turn my ADHD into my career. And the second one, as you said, I am a, a jack of many trades and a master of a few. And I think that that's something that, has guided me, uh, you know, with the idea, we went through a very specialized era, you know, and so the, this expression, oh, you know, jack of all trades, master of none was almost like, uh, you know, sort of like something that was lesser. But I think that in order to navigate the professional world right now, you can't be just doing one thing. And there's actually something that you learn from, you know, all the different disciplines. I've spent the bulk of my career in services. I started out in investment banking, then I went to Lehman Brothers, Lehman Brothers, sorry, then I went to, I got my MBA at Harvard, then I was at, in strategic consulting at Bain. So can, then, can we stop there? Just, uh, just be, you know, okay. So Lehman Brothers, 
20 years before Bain, it went back. Bain and company. Yep. I think I heard a Harvard MBA in yep. that mix. And somehow we're going to talk about leadership for everyday people. Yes, <laughs> we are. Uh, this is maybe where your marketing comes in. Uh, man, that's a sincere and that's a genuine question. It, uh, it is a genuine question. And yeah, I think, it, you know, and I think the idea of authentic leadership for everyday people comes from a 30 years journey from the person I was then. It was definitely, you know, when I was going through my investment banking, uh, her business school consulting career, I was definitely guilty of all the arrogance stereotypes that are, you know, that are sort of part of the, of, of the sort of general lore. Um, and then I, I tried a career shift uh, that didn't go well. I, I have a passion for music and I took a job at Gibson Guitars and learned in a very painful way the amount of due diligence that you need to do when you take a job for a CEO and owner of a small business. And that led actually to a very serious um, anxiety-driven breakdown and a serious depression that I came out three years after. Um, and I made a career shift at the time to get into digital marketing. I, uh, you know, in the middle of, of that crisis, the person who ran marketing at Bain, it was 1999 and Bain needed to launch their first website. And so she said, you know, while, you, while you're figuring out what you're doing and, and, and trying to, you know, get yourself together, why don't you come and help me launch the site? And in the process of launching the site, um, you know, we, we had like a little guerrilla team that was launching the site. And then we were also interviewing the big integrators from the era to find like, you know, the, the real professional services company that would then build the real website. Um, because we were, we were driven by a deadline, which is the recruiting season. You know, we needed to have a website live like in July. Um, and in the process of interviewing these companies, I found that, you know, I, I have a passion and an interest for new things and technology. Um, I love strategy, but I also like actually getting things done. And I found that the world of digital marketing, website building would be a great world for me. And, I, and that started me on what has been my career path really from 2000 until now. I, I spent 12 years in agencies, um, a place called Digitas for six years, and then like a small boutique digital agency where I ran the financial services and the media practice. And then uh, in 2012, I decided to make the jump uh, to become client side. And I took a C-level position as digital marketing officer for a company that was owned by a private equity investor. Um, and at that point, um, you know, I'd been, in, I'd been in business for about 20 something years. And this company was an hour and a half away from where I live. And my older son started high school. And I had like this realization that you know, they tell you when you have kids like, oh, they're going to go to college and they're 18, but you don't really feel it until high school starts. And there's this shift in independence. And, and I had this realization that I had spent most of my kids life running around, you know, three days a week in Seattle or three days a week in Detroit, two days a week in Philadelphia, working late. And I didn't want to miss the time. And so I made a decision to leave my job and to go and, and, and start my own consulting business um, so that I could work 60% of my time on traditional business. And then the remaining 40% I could spend with my, fam with my kids. And then my wife is a musician and I, I, she decided to relaunch her career around that time because the kids were older. And so I was managing her. And so... I wanted to be able to help her with managing the career. And I wanted to be able to be home with the kids if she had to go and play a show somewhere else. And so I, I made a decision that um, I wanted to change my life and, uh, you know, give up career path compensation for things that were important to me. And, and, and I have to say, there's a, there's a story that I tell, like in my first year at Harvard, Towards the end of the first semester, 
they in, there's a class and they, they gave us this survey. And in the survey, there was one question that said, do you think that in 10 years, you will have made enough money to stop working? And then the next day, they come and they say, well, we run this question every year. 80% of the class responds yes. But the reality is that only 20% of the class is able to do that. And, you know, one of the things that I realized that at that point in my career, when I was older, was that I was not in the 20% of the class that had made enough money to just work. And that if I wanted to pursue my non-work related interests, I needed to shift my work life to a lot of time for this. Because I love skiing. I say I like playing music. And, and some of these are activities that require a certain level of physical fitness. So for me to be able to stop working 80 hours a week and play guitar or ski at 70, like there's been a significant physical decline. And so I started this path as a digital marketing consultant. You know, I was at a place where I was just operating out of my house and uh, um, I had enough Given the amount of uh, capacity that I wanted to sell, I had enough contacts in the industry, former colleagues, former clients, that I really didn't need to market myself. And I, I did that, uh, still doing some of that now. And then, you know, as I went through the self-reflection process that people go through when they've been working for a long time, one of the things that I realized was that in the situations where I'd been really effective, my ability was not just the technical understanding of the digital marketing, et cetera, but my ability to understand di human dynamics in your organization. You know, when you're working with a Fortune 50 company and your client needs to get budget approvals to get an initiative, and then, or, you know, you, there, there are political dynamics inside the organization where there's somebody else that's gunning for your clients or things of the nature having the understanding to work with my clients, build trust relationships with them, and then coach them and guide them through all this was part of what made me effective. And I had a couple of friends who were executive coaches. Um, I had a number of friends and former colleagues that I acted as a mentor or counseling peer for. And at some point I was talking to a friend through um, a pretty complex career decision. And we were talking like, you know, two hours a week for a month. And, and he said, well, you should be my coach. I should pay you. And I'm like, no, I don't want to, I don't want you to pay me or a friend, but that kind of piqued my interest. And I talked to a couple of coach friends and that sounded like an interesting path to me. And I went through the certification process with the Coactive Institute. And as you know, because you're a coach yourself, coaching and certification is a sort of there are three activities, right? There's the learning how to coach and then there's the practical where you're coaching and being coached by your peers. And in the process of being coached, I realized that there's a part of me that needs also to be fully realized through work and that I have this passion and this mission to help people be their true selves and to help them realize this and that this was really my calling. And so um, that's when I decided to start my coaching practice, that it, it's built on this idea. My podcast is built on this idea. You know, and some of it is from realizing that on one hand, maybe, you know, I, I wasn't always like your, your traditional member of the company um, and that the situations where I'd been successful was where I'd been able to be truly myself and people appreciated who I was. And then also looking at, you know, in, in all the different environments that I had been, looking at the people who were successful and that I admired, um, they were people who had really like a big passion and a big alignment for the job. You know, my favorite managing directors at Lehman Brothers, my favorite partners at Bain, these were people who had a passion for the work that were doing it for the right reason. You know, somebody who, like I remember I did an IPO and, and for a company that was going to use the money to buy a new production line. And 
you know, the, 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 the managing director on that deal was genuinely excited about the idea that what we were doing was going to create a new production line for a company and get new, you know, get work for people. And, and it was the same at Bain. And so realizing that, you know, it, it, it to me, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you want to do or, you know, I, I don't pass judgment, but I think that everybody has an opportunity to put themselves in a position where they're doing what they love doing. And a lot of the times we are um, either constrained by the expectations of other people, or we think that if we tell somebody what we really want to do, they'll reject us. Like I had, you know, it took me a long time to get over when I was doing digital marketing and I wanted to start adding coaching to my services. It took me a long time to start getting over the idea of people that I'd seen to say, well, are you a marketer or are you a coach? You know, and say, no, it's okay that I am both because that's how I create my value. And there are clients who will love that. And there are clients who don't care for that. And that's okay if they're not my clients. And so I think bringing that, you know, bringing, giving people the ability to take that step, giving them the courage and the self-belief to say, you know, I'm going to go to my boss and say, I want to do more of this. And if they're not okay with it, I'm really good at this. And there's another company for me there that will allow me to do it. So thank you, Dino. So I appreciate your courage in uh, sharing your story, uh, the pathways that have led you to be digital marketer, coach, musician, producer, father. And I think about your description of being the genuine thing to be real, that you hang together now as a, an engineer might describe it. And as we might commonly call integrity. I got the real deal here with Dino Cataneo. Yeah. So that's interesting because I was listening to an episode of your podcast today where you had a conversation with your guest about integrity and authenticity. And I had a huge breakthrough thanks to that conversation. Thank you. And the breakthrough that I had, because you were saying, you know, integrity is the same as authenticity, is that integrity is a quality. Authenticity is a state. Like I come, you know, I studied in a classical high school in Italy. I studied Greek. And when I think of authenticity, I think about the etymology of the words, mm -hmm. which is autos, which is the self, mm -hmm. and entus, which is the inside. Mm -hmm. And so authenticity is the inside self or the true self. So for me, authenticity is a state where we are able to be our true selves, right? And so in some way, somebody who doesn't have integrity can be authentic because they're authentically lacking integrity when they betray you. It's interesting. I think about the juxtaposition of trust and integrity, Dino, and uh, I think it differs slightly and yet may be related that if I don't think you have integrity, I won't trust you. And if I don't trust you, it's likely I won't think you have integrity. These ideas am, are related, right? Those are 100% related. And 100%. How, do you, how do you, um, given the blend and perspectives that you bring, what is authentic leadership for everyday people? I describe it in terms of the congruency of thoughts and words and actions that result in creating happiness for yourself and for those around you, and therefore gaining an uh, ability to make meaningful, relevant, inspiring, productive work that is at the core of innovation, perhaps achieved in effective interpersonal relationships that uh, promote a sense of stewardship and fun and uh, 
benefit from work. How, how are you thinking about it in the work that you do? Yeah, so I think that your definition is perfect. So the way, the way that I think about it, there's, there, there's two parts in, my, in, in, my, in the authentic leadership for everyday people. So let's start with the authentic leadership. And that is essentially, I think the magical word that you use is the word of congruency, right? For me, authentic leadership is there's a level of intentionality where I work with my clients to help them define their core values and then define sort of their aspiration and what they really truly want to do and then intentionally act that way. And so they're, they're acting in a way that is congruent with their values and aspiration. And that brings happiness, but as you, as you rightly highlighted, it brings performance. Because there's a, I've seen a graphic, I don't remember where, where it says sort of like fulfillment is operating, you know, it's like it's a Venn diagram. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it's operating at the place where what you're passionate about intersects with what you're good about and with sort of creating something good for humanity, right? And I think that we can call it in a different way, but I think that your definition of congruency to, to get to happiness is exactly what I mean by authentic leadership. The for everyday people part of it is the idea that we can all be leaders in different ways in our life and that we have been presented with, you know, in the business world and, and, and et cetera, with a vision of li- leadership that is limited. And that, you know, at any point in time, no matter what is the level of authority that we have, we can take a leadership role. It may not be like the, le- the big leadership role, but we can be the leader and we can be the person that can drive what's important. And the way that I, that I do that in my podcast is by, you know, some of, some of my guests are people like you or, you know, CEOs or the people who have been incredibly successful that are naturally looked at leaders. But then some of my guests are doing things that you not, would not immediately think of as a leadership role. I had a guest who is an old friend of mine from Italy who has spent her whole life working with countries and helping them transition from post-Civil War. So she monitored the elections in Kosovo. She trained um, the election officials in Iraq on how to run a democracy. She trained guerrillas in Angola on how to, you know, do a regular job after, um, after the Civil War. Uh, you know, that's not something that we think of as leadership traditionally, but, you know, because she, she's just like, she's somebody who's done this her whole life, and, but she's not somebody who's famous or a big CEO. Another person that I had as a guest is the woman who runs the pop music program at Arizona State. And she quit her position as a songwriting teacher at Berkeley College of Music that for those who are familiar with music education is like one of, top the, top, school. One of the top three institutions in the world. And she decided to go to a big state school because she had the opportunity to craft a program that would give access to musical education and top music business education to segments of the populations that were not normally served by it. You know, and an example that she makes is schools like Berkeley have an audition required, right? But if you're 17, unless you're somebody in the like the top like 2% of supremely talented musicians, in order for you to get to the level of proficiency that is required to get accepted in a school like Berkeley, You need to have had parents who have paid for music lessons for you, who have bought you instruments, right? And so there are, in the general population of people who are interested or aspiring to make music, there are people who have the same level of talent as some of the people that have auditioned, but they've not had the resources. And the way that she, so the way that she changed the admission program, now these people have access to this education. And so, you know, these are all, leadership positions, as I said, that are not 
what we think of. And, and, and these are people that are making powerful, impactful change in the world. And so that's the other part that I try to bring out. I've always distinguished it between uh, big L leadership and lowercase or yeah. uh, uppercase leadership and lowercase leadership. And I also think um, perhaps even more broadly uh, or with uh, uh, more of a horizon is that everyone can exercise leadership. And we distinguish between you know, leaders and leadership because yes. leadership can be exercised from any chair. And in the processes um, that I work with, you know, bright people, technically capable, good interpersonal skills, is to really think about what do we catalyze in a you, to promote your effectiveness, your being um, in a different way to maybe eliminate some worries or concerns that you have move towards goal-directed behavior so that as we catalyze that, we can then capitalize on uh, what you're doing really well, appreciate uh, uh, those uh, strengths and develop those and work on those so that we can condition for success. And at the same time, bring an awareness that some of those success behaviors that we uh, employ are the very things that are preventing us from growing, developing, and changing and improving our everyday leadership and our ability to lead uh, groups and teams and others. Yes. I, I'm smiling because I think that some of this is, I, I know you have a, you're a certified or trained immunity change coach at that's uh -huh. something that I love. I've, uh, I've, uh, I've done the training. You heard I, that in my. I, I use immunity maps with some of my, and I think it's so true. It's like, it was such an eye-opening moment for me re reading that. Yes, I agree with you 100%. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. I, you know, I think, it's I, I think it's interesting. If you look at a lot of the coaching or training approaching, ultimately, this notion that we have this trait that get us to success and then when it becomes too much of those traits, then they become barrier, like, you know, within the leadership circle profile, for instance, you know, and so it, it, that's a very interesting, that's something that's a fast, that, that's definitely a fascinating. And to understand that, uh, you, you know, leading others occurs in a social context and uh, whatever models or uh, ideas uh, that condition how you think about those and, you know, the situations in which people engage, those which would, in which they uh, fly away from or flee or thinking about any of the, uh, those models. Very helpful for a group leader uh, to begin to create community. I yes. think as we continue to move forward, uh, we'll need to, leaders will continue to need to think about stewarding communities uh, maybe a little less about culture and um, more about community or the intersection of those ideas. And yes, I'm very, um, I'm anticipating the kind of uh, great work that uh, is going, will be going on in those, those spaces. Yeah, it's definitely, and, and it, it, I think it's a fascinating time to be dealing with leadership right now because so many ideas and concepts that you and I were raised with are being turned on their head. Sure. Right. And how will you, you know, as we uh, think about 2022, how will you, you know, um, be the best man you possibly can be? I mean, how are you going to aspire to that in 2022? And what advice would you have for others on that journey? It's one of the things I talk about in authentic change and authentic leadership is, you know, bringing your best to every situation, uh, being more of who you are. And I know one of the things that's um, central uh, to your story to, is uh, to be the best man you possibly can. So how, what's the guidance? What's the path for 2022? I think like, I think the big lesson that I've learned over the past three or four years through a series of experiences is openness. You know, I, I came 
as I said, I was raised in a very standardized business world, you know, where the certain behaviors and certain things. And then, and where you were really trained to think that you were always right. And I think that the, the first thing to openness is to just look at the person across and, and instead of thinking why they could be wrong, thinking why they could be right. Like in every situation, instead of thinking what's wrong with this picture, thinking what's right with this sure. picture. And that's a, that's a, that's a gratitude. And um, that is when we see things, you know, we're, we're, when we're grateful for what we have as opposed to what we don't have or what's lacking in another person or what they don't bring to a situation. I do think it, there is some gratitude there. You may have a different perspective. You know, it, it is greater, but it's more than that. It's like if you're having a meeting with somebody, with a partner, and they're like, we should do this, this, and this, and this. And there's like three of those things that are, for your first thing that you're saying, they're wrong. And to me, it's like, well, there's one thing that is there. So let's start from the thing that is right and build from there. Right. Uh, I, you know, one trick in uh, consulting that you're probably aware of is that, you know, imagine the end state and it's the last day and you're writing the final report. Yeah. What would it say? And yeah, you know, perhaps it flows from there. I mean, to get creating these yeah. idealistic future scenarios or alternative scenarios. You know, and then I think like the second thing in terms of being the best person that I can possibly, I think that, you know, we are all running our lives and underneath we have this pandemic that is not going away. And they're recognizing that everybody is already started with like a, with a, with you know, with a, with a state of, of of with a wound or or a you know or, or or something where like where they're already hurting no matter and that's even before we get into the situation and so I think it's really important to have empathy for the people across from you you know and that and that's the that's the the the, the second and then the third thing is for me in terms of like being the best person that I can, it goes back to checking in intentionally. Okay. You know, I'm saying that I have a value of transparency. Am I leaving to that? You know, and, and, I, and I'm seeing that um, this year, I actually ended up half of my time is dedicated to starting a marketing agency with a friend and it's a complicated story. So how it could happen. But it's basically, it's going to be the place where all my digital marketing will now live under this umbrella and, and we're building this firm and we're having a lot of conversations around, okay, you know, we're going to, we, when we were part of other people's agencies, transparency was important for us. It was bothering that, you know, the owners wouldn't share their financials. We're going to share the financials with our team. They're going to know where we are, you know, and, and really just calling yourself out and making sure that whatever you say your values are, you're actually making choices and decisions of those. And especially when it gets difficult, you know, I think you have, I'm sure you've been in a situation where there was an opportunity to take a client that was a, would have been a big financial boon, but it was maybe not the best client for you or the organization or making decisions that would be, beneficial in the short term, but could hurt the long term, the values. And I'm hoping that I will, you know, I will stick to that. I, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all, there's always a gray area where it's hard to operate, but I'm going to try to stay as much as I can. Well, so I white. think about it, integrity gets tested, uh, you know, at different times, different stages in life. And, uh, and it is our goal, I think, or, you know, many of us strive for being authentic to all of that. So how do we, you know, design our experiences with integrity in mind and uh, construct those uh, so that yeah. we can be true to a set of values that we've uh, thought through, that we've selected, that we've chosen yeah. um, to guide our work. And as you say, to be informed by others. Yes. I mean, to, 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 you know, and I think like it's certainly easier to have this mindset later later on in life because when you're young, you just 
first of all, you don't have the perspective that actually you have a lot more life and career ahead of you than you think you have. And, you know, there's certainly, there's a certain drive that is wonderful that you have when you're young. Uh, there's, you know, and, and, and there's a carelessness that it's wonderful because it gets you to do things. But I think when you've had perspective, you know, you're, you're looking at the world a little differently. And, and for me right now, what's important is to really have control over what I do is the most important thing. I interviewed Rishat Tabakawala for my podcast. And a question that I ask all my guests is, how do you measure success? And his answer was like, success to me is to spend as much as possible of my time doing things that I want to do. And it was such a way to crystallize what I feel, what I think I've been trying to get to. You know, I just want to do things that I want to do. You know, I don't want to take jobs where the activities are not good for me. Yeah. Well, you know, I always think about the story from the Velveteen Rabbit. You can't please everyone, so you might as well please yourself first. (laughs) <laughs> uh, yes. so that you can work on those other more you know yeah. meaningful productive inspiring important relationships yeah. but even about yeah. it, but there's like i think there's also like a tactical level right like i know that i'm really good at certain things and not right. very good at others and so i have a partner who's really good at the things that i'm not good at and and we have a divide and conquer so she does certain portion of the work and i do other portions of the work and I would imagine that that originates, or if we trace the origin story to that, it, it, it originates from trust. It originates from trust, yes. A deep trust with this person. Like we have worked together in different environments for 10 years, and we have had opportunities to see. Yeah, it's a trust that's been built that I don't, I don't have built with many people professionally just because we just have an opportunity in different moments you know when you're like okay who can i really count on in my life and those people are like maybe two or three when when you know when when things get really hard we have both been in in situations in the past where like okay he is one of the people that i can count to she's one of the people that i can count on it and there's a wonderfulness in this relationship now you know, in, 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 in being able to say, Hey, you shouldn't be doing that. And knowing that it's coming from a place of deep trust and care for one another. In 2022, how do we encourage more trust, more, more trusting relationships in workplaces? I think, you know, trust is earned, right? Because in some constructions, you know, some people believe trust is freely given and others believe that trust is earned. Yeah. But like there needs to be a situation, like it requires like, so, you know, there's an act of faith almost at the Mm -hmm. beginning. I trust you. Right. Uh, Sure. And I think that the, the ability to build trust needs to go both ways. Right. It needs to be like, I need to be, to behaving in a way that people are going to trust me. But at the same time, I need to be willing to give trust to people. Right. And, and, and I think that connects into vulnerability. I need to take Mm. some risks where I'm going to be willing to, I'm going to trust you. Right. And I think that for me personally, one of my core values is I don't remember the name exact that I put to it, but it's this idea that I'm going to trust at the beginning in every relationship. I'm always going to start with the assumption that the other party is coming from a place of goodness. And I'm going to give, and I'm going to give them that trust. And, you know, with the, with an understanding that over the long run, that decision to give trust will not always pay off, but the, statistically, the majority of the times will pay off. So if I trust 100 people and 20 turn out not to be trustworthy, I still have now a trust relationship with 80. And that can multiply. Exactly. It doesn't necessarily need exactly. to be an additive exactly. relationship, exactly. right? Because we have to think about the ability to uh, scale and scope leadership 
exactly. it's authentic leadership uh, from one to one to one to many. And um, I think that's a great pathway as we uh, go through 2022. And we think many of our listeners are coaches or yep. have relationships or have been in coaching relationships. And uh, I think it's a great pathway to explore in 2022 how we create these opportunities to uh, scale our trust with others. Yeah. I mean, if I, when, when we're talking about like the scaling and in a leadership position, the first thing is, you know, the first step in building trust is giving up control. Right. Holding on and letting go and uh, knowing yeah. your values. I think those are all part of an equation. Exactly. It's like, it, 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 and it's some of it is trusting yourself. If you trust yourself that you've built a team of people that know what they're doing, then it's easier to, you know, say, okay, I'm going to trust that they, they, they do what they need to do. And maybe it's having the ability to learn as the distinguishing uh, factor of success to be able to, you know, uh, hold oneself out as both subject and object and uh, to learn from those experiences and to um, be willing to embrace the frustration and anxiety and stress that comes with learning. Yes. And like, you know, if, if our, if our listeners could see me, I, they would see me nod and do what you're saying. Yeah. And, and, right. and I think the other part of this equation that I don't think is often, um, talked about is the ability to assess consequences, meaning uh, we, you know, we instinctively have a very binary mindset when it comes to trust. Everything will be great or will be horribly wrong, but there's different stakes in different decisions where you're trusting and being able to assess that situation where even if your trust is misplaced, the consequences are not too bad. It's a good exercise to do that. You know, and I think, oh, yeah. Perfect. And you know, just as uh, we begin to wrap up and thinking about uh, this uh, stellar journey that we've been on in terms of describing authentic leadership for everyday people and your experiences and your, uh, your bravery and sharing the story uh, that you have and the illumination that you're providing uh, for others, uh, integrating really so many different facets of organizational experience. How would people get in touch with you if they wanted to be in touch with you? Yeah, so they can go to my website. It's called authenticleadershipforeverydaypeople.com. I also have, uh, since it's a long website to type, I also bought a redirect, which is al, the number four, ep.com. So the initial of everything, authentic leadership for everyday people. So al4ep.com and I'm Dino at al4ep.com and you can find me on LinkedIn um, and on a little bit on Twitter, but LinkedIn is probably another great place. If you were to provide a little inspiration for this year, what would it be? Since I'm a musician, I'm going to go with a quote from Sting um, from the song English in New, York, in New York and it is be yourself no matter what they say. That's great. Be, be yourself no matter what they say. What they say. It's a great way to uh, wrap up, uh, Dino, to uh, think about 2022, to how we bring more of who we are to what we do, to bring our best to every situation, to engage with others. It's been a delight for me to be uh, part of this uh, experience to kick off uh, season two with you, Dino Cataneo, and uh, I thank you uh, very much for the grace and uh, uh, and uh, insights and perspectives and story that you've shared here on Authentic Change with Mike Horn. Mike, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for being willing to be on this experiment of the double podcast. <laughs> All right, Dino, that's great. Yes, and uh, I encourage everyone to listen to, uh, tune into Dino's uh, podcast authentic leadership for everyday people and to visit him at Dino at al4ep.com. That's, uh, that's the first letter, uh, more or less, except for the four, <laughs> which is a Number, numeral yeah. authentic leadership for everyday people.com al4ep.com. Um, I love the possibilities, the intersections, the more we share, the more we gain, uh, uh, the richer we are. So to everyone, 
Uh, thank you. Welcome to season two of Authentic Change with Mike Horn. And stay well until uh, the next episode of season uh, two. That will be episode two, season two. I think it has a number with it as well. I'm so glad to have uh, you join me. Welcome our new listeners and encourage everyone who's uh, enjoyed this uh, podcast with Dino Cataneo to uh, like it and encourage you to visit uh, Dino's podcast, Authentic Leadership for Everyday People, and uh, look forward to it. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. And I hope you'll subscribe today and tell a friend about our show. If you're looking for hands-on help to increase your success through authentic change or have a question you'd like to hear me answer here, please email me at mike at mike-horn, H-O-R-N-E dot com.